All right. Okay, I think we're already recording. So let's get started. It's right on the hour. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending. Um, welcome. Um, today's session is Demystifying Federated Access to Content. I have some housekeeping items um, before we begin. We have about 90 minutes scheduled for today. All attendees have been muted. This session is being recorded. We'll email you the link to the video. Towards the end of the webinar, I'll be sharing a link in the chat area. This page has resources related to our topic. Also, there's a form at the bottom of the page in case you want to request more information. Okay, and now more about the session. We have a panel of people today, including Amanda Ferrante, um, the product manager of authentication solutions at EBSCO. She will be chairing the session. We have Jennifer Sterling, a librarian and archivist from William Penn University. We also have Todd Carpenter, the executive director at NISO. Um, we have Karen Prince, the international sales manager at Open Athens, and Ralph Youngin, the senior director of technology and strategy, uh, technology strategy and partnerships at the American Chemical Society. Each um, panelist will have a quick presentation for you, and then they will answer the questions you entered during the registration for this webinar. Um, you can enter questions in the Q&A area at any time, and if we have um, if we have time for those, we'll answer them as well. Um, so let's get started, and I'll pass this off to Amanda. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. All right, perfect. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're looking forward to uh, great panel discussion on federated access. Um, but first, I want to start with a little bit of background just to set the, the tone and the context for our conversation. If you haven't been close to the library authentication conversation in recent years, uh, the background will probably help um, ahead of our panel discussion. Bear with me for one moment. To date, we've seen lots of library authentication tools that can do some, but not all of what any given library might require. They often check some boxes, but not quite all of them. As library research moves more outside of a physical location, that still rings true. Proxy servers and VPNs help the user log into library subscriptions remotely and to remain anonymous while they're doing so. But IP access doesn't support the personalization that in some cases is required or desired for a robust user experience. IP access is also notoriously insecure. So we've begun to look to SAML, which can support automatic personalization and other enhanced features like patron empowerment. However, to leverage SAML single sign-on, the remote user requires some access point to let them identify as a member of their subscribing institution. And again, as the library research moves more and more outside of a physical location, users also begin their research more and more on the open web. Search engines, while they seem to bring information much closer to our fingertips, have also demanded an assessment of how we can best support the user's ability to log in and identify as a valid authorized member of their institution. This conversation around empowering remote access has never been louder or more relevant than in the past few months as institutions around the world have quarantined in response to the COVID-19 crisis and many, many libraries still continue to support a 100% remote patron population. Looks like Ann, Amanda's been muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Sorry folks for the technical difficulties. Thank you. Um, in an era where on-premise IP access is no longer an option and all library research requires some form of remote authentication, 
Libraries and vendors alike are looking to increase successful access for those remote patrons 100% of the time, regardless of where they're starting their research. Now, if you're familiar with the Resource Access for the 21st Century, or RA21 initiative, this snapshot of library access is probably pretty familiar to you already. In 2019, after much collaborative engagement among stakeholders, RA21's recommendations were published and emphasized the importance of federated SAML-based single sign-on as fulfilling needs for security, privacy, and seamlessness, and being representative of a modern and sustainable authentication model for libraries. Of course, as the prospect of any type of change is likely to do, the idea of libraries, publishers, and vendors moving toward robust support for federated SAML access brought up as many questions, even as it answered our initial needs. Specifically, if we agree that library research begins on many devices and in many places, both physical locations and online locations, from the authenticated library portal to the open web and search engines, if we agree that this is a key feature of our users' research habits and that we need to support access wherever and however it's happening, then how can we best collaborate in making federated SAML logins more universally available and more standardized and user-friendly to empower access for all types of researchers? RE21's 2019 recommendations also suggested the path forward there. Key components of an improved solution, as they called them, would be a common element in the interface that could initiate organizational discovery and the subsequent login an optimized search for a user's identity provider or home institution that supports different types of searching, and cross-domain IDP persistence, a login point that, to the user, seems to remember the institution they previously selected and logged in with. To some, these might sound like very foundational UX recommendations, but for the purposes of this conversation, they are very important guidelines that we agree will standardize and empower successful federated logins for all researchers. We are very glad today to be joined by Jennifer Sterling, whose perspective and experience as librarian and archivist at William Penn University will be valuable in understanding how all these concepts impact libraries and the users that they serve. We're also joined by members of RA21 steering committee, Ralph Youngin and Todd Carpenter, two figures involved in moving the library authentication conversation forward. Also with us is Kieran Prince, whose experience with Open Athens has also centered on these concerns and how to come to a solution that serves both libraries and publishers. Ralph, Todd, and Kieran will help us understand how RA21's recommendations have evolved into tangible solutions, name, namely the seamless access and Wayfinder tools. And so with that background behind us, um, Jennifer, I'd like to begin our discussion with your insight, if we could. The library's experience with authentication is absolutely central to this conversation. Could you tell us a little bit about how William Penn University's library uh, journeyed toward federated single sign-on? Sure, thank you. And we'll just stop sharing my screen. Okay, and I'll get mine up. Okay, are you seeing my PowerPoint now? Yes, looks good. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks. I'm glad to be here to share, share the librarian perspective with you. Um, and I was asked to share some of the so-called pain points. Um, I'll start by just sharing a little bit about our campus because we're not the kind of place where we have, um, you know, our own information services people at our library. We are a very small residential liberal arts college in a rural area. We're in Oskaloosa, Iowa. We have about 1,200 students and we do support some distance learning programs um, here on our campus. 
Um, and then, of course, this spring, all of our students became distance learners, whether they wanted to or not. So we had that going on. Um, and we have two librarians and we have three paraprofessional staff. So a very small college and very small staff here. So um, one of the pain points with um, trying to authenticate uh, users to our databases and library services when um, before we had um, Open Athens was we were trying to maintain an easy proxy server and we were coordinating with information services um, and our information services folks are great. We have a great relationship with them. So I'm not saying anything disparaging against those folks, but they are also a very, very small staff over there. So um, every year, it, you know, it's a two way street when you're trying to maintain an easy proxy server, we would need to give them a list of new databases to add and a list of old databases to remove that we no longer subscribe to. So we would be giving them, you know, a lot of work to do. And then we would also be relying on them to get some um, IP ranges to add. And there would, you know, inevitably be a breakdown in that uh, that work. Um, and you know, you find out about that when one of those things hasn't happened. Um, and you know, like I said, they have a small staff. They've got to be adding, you know, 500 new students IDs to their system. So maybe you know their person doesn't add the one of the IP ranges and then our students can't authenticate to a database and then we've got students calling us and saying that they couldn't get to a database and then you know that's just bad customer service so that was always happening you know at the beginning of every semester and you know it's the busiest time of the year for all libraries and everyone would be rushing around trying to to fix these problems on both sides so it's a lot of work for the information services folks it's a lot of work for the library to maintain that server um, and you know nobody was really happy with with that uh, with that process another thing um, that is kind of a well, it is integral to it, is the, the lack of usage statistics. Um, we could find out really from information services how many people were turned away from the service. Uh, they would, if, but I would have to contact them and say, you know, what's going on? And they would usually tell me these people are not entering their ID correctly, which isn't the most useful stat to get you're just getting you know people that aren't doing something correctly but you know when you log in to say your ebsco admin dashboard you get stats like a number of sessions or students did 300,000 searches which you know that's good you know people are using it a lot but eventually you're kind of having the thoughts, you want to know, well, how many actual people are doing that? But you're not, you're not getting that stat out of that. And that's something that would be useful for us to have. We want to know how many actual people are authenticating or when was the last time somebody actually logged in? We would like to know that, um, or at least I, I am as a librarian, I'm curious about that but we couldn't get to that kind of information. So, you know, that's definitely um, something that we would like to know, but we're just not able to get with an easy proxy server. Um, we're also experiencing a lot of confusion and frustration for users or students. Um, we did not have a single sign-on service. So there was multiple login screen students 
had a different looking screen for their email. They had a different looking screen to log in to Moodle. We had another place where students went to check their grades and it looked different. Uh, that um, was, you know, really bad service and um, you would hear students complain about it a lot. You know, why do I have to log in multiple times every time I sit down at a computer? Because they'd want to be doing all of those different things and just logging in time after time. And none of us like that experience. It's a bad experience. Um, and the other thing is that it was just not intuitive when people sat down to do those things. Um, I would all the time I would get calls from students that would want to do something easy like log in to go search EBSCO and when they got to that easy proxy screen it would just baffle them they would get there and not want, know what to do so they would back out of it and when I would take the call I would say well what you know what did you try to do um, but instead of going in and, and entering their username and password, they would say, well, I went to ebsco.com, you know, which is the very last thing that they should have done. They should have continued on with their username and password, but it just does not look right to them um, because there's no branding or anything that tells them what they should be doing. We, IP addresses also um, do something um, really, Bad. It ties students to the place where they are and our students don't stay in the place where they need to be um, to use our services. As I mentioned, we have a lot of distance students. Um, one of our groups of students that we recruit from um, are in an education program and they are all distance students and we recruit them from schools, they're paraeducators. So they will do a lot of their homework from different schools. And we work with the state library, like a lot of um, academic libraries will do. So when we had an easy proxy server, for example, um, our contract was with the state library, was with EBSCO. So we would buy a lot of, EBS, we had a lot of EBSCO databases that were free from the state library, but then we would buy additional more academic databases from the state library. But since the school library also had EBSCO databases and those were authenticated by the IP address at the school, the students then could not sign into the easy proxy service and get to the more academic databases because that school's IP address was taking over the service and the students were tied there. And then that would also cause me problems too because I teach sometimes from, I'll go to a public library and teach a distance class and then I can't teach a live demo and use one of those academic databases and I couldn't sign into the easy proxy and do a demo because I was tied to the IP address. And this is just really inexplicable to students to try to explain that you can't use our databases because you can only access things by an IP address. So a real pain point there to not even be able to use databases that we're paying for because of where you're physically at. So once we had um, Open Athens, the Federated Access Solution, it solved so many of these problems for us. Um, we had intuitive screens that had our campus branding. Um, now, when students sign into their, it looks just like they're signing into their email or their Moodle, the exact same screen, um, or if they're off campus, they just find that campus branding, they know what to do. I have not had anyone try to back out and say, oh, I'm going to ebsco.com or something else 
and and try to do something that doesn't happen it's very intuitive and they just sign in it looks exactly the same it eliminates that whole issue um, it we also have eliminated that coordination with information services which um, i know that they're very grateful for um, we work directly with open athens to set up any new service or any new database that we purchase and they get it all set up for us which is so nice um, to just you know be able to put in a ticket or send an email and get that all done and not try to go into a database enter you know five or six ip ranges that we have uh, there's none of that problem or issue and then uh, the usage statistics are also great to be able to go in and see um, the patterns that are happening with our usage, especially this spring with um, the COVID issue, um, when our administrators were worried about, you know, what is going on with library usage, um, you know, if people are going to have to work from home, are you all still going to be able to work and our students doing work? I was able to very easily show our administrators that yes, our patterns are, be, are consistent with last year's patterns. I can see what students are doing. The traffic patterns have changed from you know, an off-campus use or have switched from being off-campus, you know, but I can still see that it's the same pattern of usage as the previous year. It's been great that way, um, but we're very happy. It's been super easy, um, and I can say that uh, I'm a very new director. This is my second year. Um, when we set up Open Athens, um, it was my first year as director, and I was interim. We, I, my old position hadn't been backfilled, so I was setting it up on my own, and it could not have been easier. So um, that concludes my slides, and I'll look forward to answering questions during uh, the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. Welcome. Um, some of the questions coming in have some to do with um, how to create Open Athens accounts. So just to clarify for our attendees, um, I wanted to ask, uh, when we talk about using Open Athens, your users are seeing the same exact screen that they see when they log into their school email and their Moodle. Um, is that because you worked with your information systems team to connect to your university's directory? And it is, in fact, the same place that they're logging in for Open Athens? Absolutely. It is the exact same screen that they see when they log into their email or their Moodle accounts. Fantastic. And it sounds like the usage you're getting is more representative of uh, people trying to find their way into library subscribe content and not so much people using a search engine to try to find their way in and then potentially hitting a paywall or um, abandoning their search. Right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I would like to move our focus to Todd Carpenter. Um, Todd, as NISO's executive director, you've been involved in this movement toward federated access from its early stages. Um, NISO's mission statement is quite clear on this, actually. Um, the mission statement is that NISO fosters the development and maintenance of standards that facilitate the creation, persistent management, and effective interchange of information so that it can be trusted for use in research and learning. Would you mind telling us about the importance of standards in the library authentication space um, and your work there? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that all of the attendees are, are safe and, and well uh, in these kind of crazy times. And I'm going to 
build on some of the things that Jennifer had said and uh, give a bit of introduction into some of the more technical bits that uh, Karen and, uh, Kieran and Ralph will get into in the next portion of the webinar. So, uh, as, as was described, NISO is a nonprofit trade association. We have about 230 members and we develop technical standards, obviously. Uh, but we participate, uh, we actually kind of organize teams of volunteers to do these things. NISO staff is uh, quite small, uh, but there's about 500 people who are working on NISO projects at any one, at any one time. And the Seamless Access Project um, and the, you know, the former RA21 initiative uh, was a joint initiative between uh, NISO and the International STM Association. Um, we have partnered further with Jayant, Internet and in Two, and ORCID in advancing the Coalition for Seamless Access, which we'll get into shortly. So the technology stack that authentication systems rely on is quite complicated. There are a variety of interlocking systems, interoperable systems, and it's kind of building up, uh, it's kind of like building a house in how all of these technologies and how the systems work together uh, to provide a, a useful seamless uh, user experience. So as service providers, as content providers, we like to think that we are provide a welcoming, a joyous experience for all those who come to uh, participate in our, uh, read our content or participate in our services. But that's not necessarily what users perceive, as Jennifer described quite uh, eloquently. They're often run into almost a you shall not pass. This is a difficult experience for users in many respects. And what we as an organization, what we as a community need to do is simplify the path of getting their users to the content that they want or the services that they're seeking. So we have been working uh, over the last several years to develop a SAML-based technology uh, that is built on multilateral, multilateral trust that uses mature technology that is widely deploy, deployed and supported in the scholarly information community uh, that many academic institutions are using as well as corporate institutions are using um, and how can we improve this user experience so what is the infrastructure upon which we're building the, some of the basics of what we're trying to do um, and one of the core features and one of the core technologies upon which we're building the infrastructure for this house is something called SAML SAML is an acronym for Security Assertion Markup Language, which is an XML-based protocol that uses tokens that contain assertions about the end user, such as that are called attributes, and those are exchanged between identity providers and consumers of that information or service providers. And the SAML system provides a cross-domain single sign-on system that reduces overhead, reduces administrative overhead, as well as technological overhead, and allows the user to move seamlessly from one system to the next. And I want to highlight some of the words that are included in these definitions, and I'll talk more about them as I move forward. Those being assertions, attributes, identity providers, service providers, tokens. All of these are critical features of our uh, of the uh, authentication process, which add features and functionality to uh, the exchange and the interoperability of these systems. And I apologize in advance. This is something of a soup of acronyms and jargon, and I'm going to slowly take you through some of these elements. Uh, if you're deeply embedded in, uh, in SAML authentication systems, this might uh, be duplicative for you, but I want to level set, make sure that everyone understands uh, some of the jargon that we're talking about. So, 
some of the basic terminology here, an identity federation. An identity federation is made up of identity providers. Those are institutions, universities, businesses who control the credentials within a community. And identity providers partner and share their credentials to a central repository, an identity federation. That is the central point at which a service provider a service provider could be a content provider like a publisher, uh, a bibliographic management tool, uh, a scholarly tool. Um, it could be your, uh, your pay payroll system. Those are all services that rely on the information about the users that are stored by the identity federation provided by the identity provider. Now, there are a variety of tools that use this technology stack, and it goes by a variety of names. Shibboleth, Open Athens, Corto, uh, Tivoli Fim, the Azure Active Directory system and ADFS that are produced by Microsoft. These are all implementations of the Federated Identity Management System, and they all use SAML to convey information about the user. So we're gonna dig a little bit into the plumbing of what these elements are uh, that are exchanged between the identity provider and the service provider. Key to this is the notion of attributes. Attributes are the sort of metadata about the user. They are passed using SAML from the identity provider to the service provider. It is managed um, by the federation and how they exchange information about the user is all managed by this uh, federated identity system. Now, what information about the user is shared, the attributes, is completely controlled by the identity provider and the federation. It is up to the federation to determine what attributes you share and under what circumstances. So in a library context, we within Seamless Access have worked on a variety of ways in which we can uh, build in attributes into our system that range from completely anonymous. So there is no personally identifiable information about the user. This person works at this institution and has access, let them in, right? We can add a layer above that, which is a pseudonymous ID, which is tied to a real person, although that information is maintained by the institution. It is not shared with the service provider. Here is a token. You can track this token across different services and that represents a person, but the real identity is unknown. The institution knows who that person is because you might wanna track back to uh, say some credentials that have been compromised. You can even add even more information about the user without describing who they are. You could say that they work in this department, they work at this campus, uh, they are a student, a faculty member. And you can also dig even more into attributes and provide very robust information about a person, such as their name, their email address. Now, depends upon the circumstance in which you're using, you're applying your SAML system, the level at which you want to share information about your user. If you say are using SAML for your payroll system or you're using SAML for your course management system, then you need to know, the system needs to know that this is Todd Carpenter and Todd Carpenter is enrolled in marketing uh, 300 and in order to display information about my classes, my homework and my grades, which is not the bundle of information that you need to pass to a publisher to provide library services. So attributes are really important in this environment because they 
allow you to determine who has access. Is this person get access to this computing resource? Does this person get access to this journal? Are they part of a, the chemistry department that has purchased special access? You can use those attributes to control costs as well as maintain a bit of security over your systems because you're separating the user, the password, and third-party information about the user. So, how does attribute release work? How does the ide identification system work to deliver this uh, information to a service provider? So, the identity provider, the institution, the employer, can opt into or out of an attribute statement and saying, this is what we want to allow information about the user. And it can be, contrib it can be configured for every category of user, every category of vendor uh, or service. Seamless Access is working on a policy to define these bundles for appropriate uses. One of the participants in Seamless Access has done a fantastic presentation, I'll give you a link to it later, that describes in very simple terms the exchange of information between the service provider, the identity provider, and the user who is using some a bit of information about Seamless Access, uh, through Seamless Access to help navigate this process. Now, importantly, the things that, buy, that motivate us to buy a house is not usually the walls. It's not usually the, the plumbing. You want to have plumbing. You want to have walls. You want to have a roof. Uh, but those aren't the things that are really going to get you excited about purchasing a house. It's the user experience. It's the finishing touches. It is the, um, you know, it might be the marble tiles. It might be the gardening. Um, often these finishing touches make the difference. And these finishing touches are really the core of what seamless access is trying to achieve. We are trying to standardize through seamless access the user experience, which Jennifer described as problematic in so many ways, with so many different buttons, so many different user interfaces, that's confusing the end user. So the RA21 initiative and the seamless access initiative that's followed is trying to build a standardized method by which a call to action for the users that they will recognize, hey, access through your institution, a call to action, access, use your uh, uh, credentials that were given to you by a Cal State to log into this, uh, to this content and trying to get publishers, all publishers, all service providers to use this common call, call to action to drive people to use um, this uh, federated service. So I've bounced between RA21 and Seamless Access a couple times. Um, RA21 was a standards project within NISO and STM to develop a recommended practice for how to do this thing. Seamless Access is the implementation of that. Seamless Access is the production service, if you will, of what uh, RA21 laid out as a recommendation. And one of the other features uh, that is involved in this process is the protection of privacy. So as I mentioned, SAML has a variety of use cases. And so depending on your use case will determine whether or not what sort of level of attributes you want to share. So in the case of library services, you can use SAML by not sharing any attributes at all. And in that way, SAML can be privacy protecting. Obviously, you could make a mistake and share too much uh, or intentionally share a lot of information about the user. But that is all controlled by the institution. 
So I'm going to draw to a close there. I want to draw your attention to two videos uh, that talk about how federated authentication works, a little bit more detail uh, than I've just given you here, as well as a discussion about privacy attributes and why they're important and how to manage this process if you're using a SAML system. And I've, these URLs would be posted um, in the documents that are circulated, so you'll have access to those. So with that, thank you very much, and we will I'll pass it back. Thank you so much, Todd. That was great. Um, we received quite a few questions in the Q&A during your presentation, so um, I'm going to try to boil them down to a few <laughs> general themes. It's a good um, thing we have lots of time later. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, we got quite a few questions around the pseudonymous identifier, and um, the questions really centered on uh, a little bit more information would be helpful. Um, and I think potentially understanding what many institutions use, what piece of data actually qualifies as a pseudonymous identifier. So that's the first question. And as a secondary part, I'd like to add um, a question about whether there are any recommendations to libraries who are trying to understand data attribute release best practice right now that you know of. Um, so I will leave you with those. Sure, great. So a pseudonymous identifier is just an, a, a string that says, think of it as a badge, right? So in a SAML exchange, you say, here is information about this person. It could be nothing. Here is no information about this person. We give you nothing apart from, yes, they should be authenticated. A pseudonymous identifier is simply a token. It's, it's a string, uh, an identifier string that says, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is this person. And every time you want to interact with this person, use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And so in that way, there is a measure of contextual awareness that Todd Carpenter keeps coming back to the ACS website. And so we'll be able to provide some information that is relevant based on their browsing history, say, for example, right? But it is not specific to me. It is distinct from me. So you can't ever associate Todd Carpenter with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Um, you'd need to know more. The institution knows more, knows that they have sent one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in place of my email, in place of my name, in place of any other attributes about me. So the institution say, if my credentials were compromised, my institution could come knocking on my door and say, hey, you need to change your password, blah, 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 blah. But the service provider doesn't know that that's me. So that's the distinction between completely anonymous and pseudonymous. Here's an identifier as opposed to we're going to send you Todd Carpenter's email address and every time Todd Carpenter logs in, you know it's Todd Carpenter, right? So there is a level of break between knowing who this person is and knowing that this person is the same person who was here yesterday. Um, as far as recommendations go and who is using these things, uh, we're in the, early stages of rolling some of this out, uh, institutions do use pseudonymous identifiers for their services, um, but we're trying to push this a little bit more within the, the library community, as well as pushing the IT community that for library services, anonymous is totally fine. Um, that's also something we are pushing. Uh, there is a lot more information that we, about the how SAML works and how authentication systems work. Uh, seamless Access is the Outreach Committee of Seamless Access is trying to pull some of that information together in reports and, and also some of these videos uh, that describe how some of the services work. And if you have any questions or if you have problems or things you'd like explained, you know, feel free to drop us a line. We're happy to produce some of these resources for the community. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Todd. Um, and I just received a link to a really, really helpful and clear blog post on seamlessaccess.org that covers the introduction to identity attributes and attribute release. So for all of our attendees, I will put that in the chat for you if you're interested in seeing more information. Great. Thank you. So we're going to shift gears and move on to Kieran Prince, uh, who is the International Sales Manager with Open Athens. Kieran, as a longstanding member of Open Athens sales team, you've probably had the opportunity to speak with lots and lots of stakeholders in this space. So based on your experience, how does the need for standardizations impact publishers as well as libraries specifically? And could you take us through how the Wayfinder tool aimed to begin fulfilling that need when it was first introduced in 2018? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'll be doing a, a demo of uh, the Wayfinder a little bit later on. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to be talking about federations and federated authentication, uh, the often mystical topic. Um, so expanding on Amanda's introduction uh, and Todd's presentation, so I'm going to be taking us through a little bit of a uh, history lesson before we move on to talking about today's implementation of SAML. Uh, I think it's really important to, to look back when we come up the, with new solutions. Um, it's an important part of moving forward. So with a focus on academia, this is a high level view of the history of authentication, uh, all going all the way back to the 1970s with IP addresses. Uh, for a long time, IP addresses were, and for many still are, uh, used as a primary method for authentication and accessing digital content. With IP addresses not in short demand, uh, and you know, IP addresses could be attributed to individual machines, they were ideal for providing broad access to platforms. Um, even 10 years ago, while I was at university, a great deal of research was done uh, by physical means and on the library, uh, in the library, so for a long time, it did fit the needs of the, of the user. So fast forward uh, to 96, we have the invention of uh, VPNs. Again, building on those IP-based services to provide offsite access. But anybody who has to use a VPN will know they are unstable. And by design, they are uh, a workaround. A year later, we saw what we believe is the world's first attempt at standardizing access to content within the academic sector. Uh, Athens, as we were known back then, was a community-led project to implement uh, SSO across UK universities. Uh, it was designed at the University of Bath um, by a group of librarians and it was rolled out successfully to all institutions and it was around this time we saw the first content providers and publishers adopting Athens. And just a few years later, uh, Easy Proxy came along Again, building on uh, IP services to provide a more robust solution for offsite access. Uh, and it's still the primary authentication method for many institutions around the world, particularly in North America. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. It's cheap, uh, relatively easy to implement, and at the moment provides pretty good coverage of resources. And then we get to SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language. Uh, now, this is a technology specifically designed for authentication. If you use internet banking or Microsoft, then you're already using SAML. It's essentially an incredibly secure way to pass information across the internet. And a few years after development started, Shibboleth was released, and that expanded on the old SAML technology and provided some additional functionality. It was released as open source code. So even today, thousands of institutions and publishing houses will still use it for single sign-on. And Open Athens eventually adopted the open standard SAML themselves five years later, using the word open to reflect the move to adopting SAML. Some of our longstanding customers will still refer to us as Athens, uh, and you can imagine how much our marketing team enjoy that. Uh, finally, there are some contemporary services available. Uh, OpenID Connect has a similar concept to SAML and its uptake has been slow but steady over recent years. Uh, and many of the social media platforms are using it. Uh, and then we have CASA, which provides seamless access to content uh, within an IP range. But we're going to concentrate here. These are modern authentication solutions. Shibboleth and Open Athens both use SAML, and there is a global infrastructure in place built on this technology, which we'll talk about later. 
But this timeline reflects the evolution in user behavior. Uh, mobile and remote access are critical factors. And again, SAML is ideal for authentication uh, and it's the best solution we have, at least for the foreseeable future. So Todd mentioned federations and federated authentication a little bit earlier, but where do federations come into this? Um, so we spoke about that global infrastructure and federations are just that. They have lots of functions, but they can be broken down into two primary considerations, uh, trust and scalability. Uh, trust because by using SAML, federations are able to set technical rules. So whether you are an organization or a publisher, your trust is implicit by your membership of a federation. And federations talk about organizations as members because federations really are like a club. Federations like open up and set the technical rules and adhering to them allows institutions to easily access their subscriptions and other digital services. If you have Open Athens or Shibboleth, there's a good chance you're in a federation. And on to scalability. Uh, setting up access to resources can be done over email. So no proxy configs or routine changes are required. Librarians benefit from using single sign-on for multiple resources. But for publishers, they benefit from having a secure solution they can provide to multiple organizations. Federations provide a standardized authentication service at scale. So federations are essentially networks that use SAML to connect organizations to thousands of apps, databases, and journals. And when we talk about federations, we're really talking about seamless single sign-on, accessing multiple platforms with a single username and password. Federations are just the infrastructure that facilitates single sign-on. So my hope over the next few slides is to give you an idea of some of the challenges uh, the industry is facing with regards to accessing digital content. Uh, so when we talk about some of the solutions later on, you have a good idea of the questions that we are trying to answer. So I've just pulled a variety of screenshots from some well-known digital resources. And it should be clear to you already that there's a great deal of variety in login experiences. Uh, and this is really the crux of the issue. Uh, SAML has given us the tools to provide seamless access and seamless single sign-on. But as with any open standard, uh, it's open to interpretation with no great oversight. Uh, it's created uh, too much variety in login experiences. Simple things like consistent language. You'll see login via, open, via Athens at the top left there, find your institution, uh, but also uh, publishers listing federations, as you can see in the middle there, uh, providing long lists of organizations. Uh, too much variety uh, and too much choice when perhaps there should be, should be less, there should be uh, fewer options for logging into resources. And Shibboleth and Open Athens are technical terms. You should not expect users to understand what the difference is. Uh, they use the same technology and again, there should be less choice when it regards, with regards to institutional access. But with no great oversight, uh, this variety is to be expected. Uh, publishers often tell me they have uh, invested huge sums of money providing and developing their own single sign-on solutions. But if everybody does single sign-on themselves, then it isn't really single sign-on. And perhaps Easy Proxy provides a solution here. But as many of you will be aware, you can't log into a, a publisher platform directly via Easy Proxy. Without those links, you cannot access the content. So again, it omits that particular user journey. And we'll talk about another user journey just here. So what about discovery? So we've covered uh, one user journey going directly to a resource, but how about article level access via discovery services, perhaps EBSCO Discovery, ProQuest, or, or even Google Scholar? So I've picked this uh, particular platform uh, and I want to read this article beyond the abstract. First off, I need to hit this PDF tab at the top left-hand corner. And once I've done that, I'm providing with access options right at the bottom of the page. Uh, and immediately this is rather well hidden. I had to scroll down to find this. If I hit that access option button, I'm providing with three choices, login or register, Open Athens or login via institution. And again, Open Athens and login via institution leverage the same technology. So perhaps it would be better here just to have login via institution because Open Athens organizations could also use that same link. 
once I click that link, uh, more technical jargon with shibboleth sign in, and I have lists of federations. And again, users should not be expected to uh, know which federation they're a part of. These are technical terms. Um, and again, like Todd said earlier, you should not be, uh, you don't get excited about the walls in the house. It, it's the stuff uh, on top of that. So again, taking away uh, that unknown, those, uh, those technical language um, is, is something we recommend to publishers. But beyond the demand for easier access to content, user demands have changed in other areas. If I log into some of the apps I use at home, I'm offered a personalized experience. I can't imagine writing down the timestamp of the show I was watching on Netflix, for example, just so I could start uh, restart where I left off, uh, or even not having uh, my purchase records on, on Amazon. But these services are not unique to my apps I use at home. Publishers are leveraging SAML to, to provide personalization. SAML facilitates personalization as information can be passed whenever a user logs in. And though it doesn't even need to be personal identifiable information, as Todd alluded to earlier, and you can still make use of things like saved content and recommended articles. And finally, the elephant in the room. The recent pandemic has only accentuated the need for remote access to content. And this wasn't you, users have demanded access, uh, remote access for years, but the virus certainly highlighted how important it was to be able to access content wherever you are and on any device. And you might recognize, recognize this alert. Uh, most publishers have responded in some way to the, to the virus situation, providing free content or uh, relaxing licensing uh, limits or usage limits. And SAML, Open Athens, Shibboleth, they all uh, took care of the huge increase in demand for remote access. Again, leveraging that existing infrastructure to provide greater scale uh, in terms of remote access needs. And when we talk about those users, it's the users that matter most. They're the most important part of this equation. If they don't access the journal you paid for, that impacts you as the library and it impacts the publisher. Most of these tweets uh, are driven by frustrated, frustrations in an inconsistent user journey. Uh, the things we've already discussed today, users shouldn't need to know what federation they're a part of. They just want to hit as few barriers as they can while doing their research. And when they don't, they often turn to their peers. This is a common hashtag on Twitter. You can just go ahead today and search for this hashtag and you'll see lots of people trying to find content that they do have a perception they don't have access to. And again, this is often driven by frustrating user journeys. Uh, we did our own research a few years ago and we found out users were often, they often felt less guilty about accessing content this way if they knew they could access the content legitimately, legitimately through their subscriptions. The good news is that the industry is coming up with solutions. Uh, you know, Ralph will talk about seamless access in more detail uh, a bit later on. Uh, people are getting their heads together, uh, and I'll talk about Wayfinder, our own solution to the to UX headache uh, later on as well. But the important thing to, to remember is most of the hard work uh, has already been done. The tools are there to be used. I think we just need to have uh, an ongoing dialogue, hold publishers accountable for their user journeys, because uh, ultimately this is impacting the industry and forcing traffic to sites like SciHub. Uh, we could talk for a full hour about uh, you know, why federations exist, their funding, their structure, uh, but 10 minutes is, is not enough time. But hopefully I've given you enough insight in these 10 minutes uh, to, to give you a better idea of how this all fits together. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That's fantastic. Um, I think it, what we're touching on throughout all of these presentations too is that authentication for libraries does tend to be a real game of semantics sometimes. Um, so it looks like, and Todd really aimed to clarify this too, that when we talk about Shibboleth and Open Athens, just to clarify their part in the authentication handshake, they are the services that are driving the logins, um, but not necessarily, they don't need to be branded as the access point on a publisher's website. Is that sort of the conclusion that we've gotten toward in uh, the name of a better user experience? I think so, yeah. So we, you spoke about earlier about uh, with, um, we often integrate with local directories. So the users may not necessarily know if they're using Open Athens or even Shibboleth. Uh, ultimately, the underlying technology shouldn't, shouldn't be considered by the user. I think having less choice on the publisher platform, 
leveraging the existing infrastructure and taking away any technical jargon. I think the issue is these products were built by developers, often for developers. Um, so the, the, the language has snuck in when, you know, perhaps with a little bit more marketing now, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So I think, you know, Seamless Access uh, and Open Athens and other organizations that are trying to simplify uh, this, whole, this whole process and, and get rid of any jargon you might, you might be uh, currently guilty of. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kieran. All right. Well, that was a perfect segue into uh, our next speaker, um, Ralph Youngin. Ralph, uh, I'd like to turn things over to you at this point. As Senior Director of Digital Strategy and Business Integration at ACS, it sounds like you've been pretty involved with the application of some of these agreed upon standards that aim to support successful end user access. Could you tell us a bit about your experience um, supporting access for ACS and your experience with seamless access? Yes, I absolutely will. Um, thank you. And yes, I've been quite involved in um, two, in particular, two industry efforts for the past few years that are looking to streamline um, pathways to scholarly content. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak to you both today about both um, GetFTR um, uh, getfulltextresearch.com and I'll give a little more information about seamless access as well building on some of the information that Todd has already provided to us. So first let me, let me start with GetFTR because we haven't talked about that yet today. Um, if you're not aware GetFTR is a service that is being built by five leading publishers that I, I have shown here on this slide and the uh, the purpose of GetFTR is to provide on-the-fly verification of a user's institutional entitlement to a journal article. Um, and so you can think about the target targeted use case for GetFTR would be any place where a researcher would be, would be doing a literature search. So uh, a pure discovery service, you know, something like PubMed or Web of Science, something like that. Um, or a scientific collaboration network, perhaps something like Mendeley, or a library management system as well, um, where um, some of those systems have this kind of entitlement aware capability built into them. That's, that's the target for GetFTR. And GetFTR works by providing back to those discovery services a smart link that is customized based upon the user's institutional affiliation. And that link works regardless of whether or not the user is um, on campus, off campus, on a mobile device, do doesn't really matter uh, where the user is. Um, when a user clicks on one of these smart links, uh, they land on the publisher website and if they are on a recognized IP address, that's fine. They get access directly to the content. But if they are not on a uh, recognized IP address, since that link is customized to the user's institutional context, it automatically, the user is automatically redirected to their institutional login page where they can easily just act log in, you know, as they normally do um, through that login page and then get access to the content. So a little bit of di uh, mock up here showing how this works. I'm showing you here a search result uh, coming out of Mendeley and you'll see in the upper part there that it says my institution is set to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And there's that view PDF button there that has the, the GetFTR logo on it. So if I am not on a recognized IP address, when I click on that, I would have come to the ACS site. It said, well, I don't know this IP address. It redirected automatically to the uh, appropriate login page where I could just simply enter my credentials and then get immediate access to the content um, that I was, I was searching for. And here's an example of another um, user experience treatment. This is on dimensions that shows how they actually place the, uh, the GetFTR uh, information in a hover um, state above the view PDF button here that says, okay, I recognize you do have access to this article through your institutional affiliation. And by the way, when you click on this link, you might have to log in in order to get access to that article. So that's just another way that, that uh, integrators can, um, can make that happen for the users. 
So where we are in the current state with GetFTR, we've been in a pilot phase, uh, open pilot since April of 2020. Um, we are inviting other publishers and other integrators to join us. Um, I did show here that one of the integrators that just joined recently is the is Researcher app, and they have a very nice blog that they just wrote uh, that's uh, posted on the site uh, about their integration with uh, GetFTR. Um, GetFTR is going to be funded by publisher fees, um, and we have other. Uh, we're in dialogue with many other publishers right now, and in dialogue with many other integrators right now. No charge for integrators. Those publisher fees will start to uh, kick in next year, as the plan here. So I just wanted to show, share that with you all. Another um, another service that is uh, you know working to accomplish this goal of streamlining access to content. So I'll switch now and talk a little bit more, provide a little bit more detail about seamless access uh, that Todd has already spoken about. Uh, just to reinforce, this is the operational service that we are building based upon the RA21 uh, recommendations that we produced. So seamless access is all about user experience. Seamless access doesn't really touch the underlying SAML um, authentication protocols in any way. It is really looking to replace these search, these, discuss, these institutional search um, capabilities that Karen mentioned that are in place across uh, publisher sites that are different on every publisher site today. And the whole goal about seamless access is to replace all of that complexity and all that technical jargon with just a simple button that has the user's institutional affiliation contextualized within that button so that the user has a very clear call to action in order to log in through their institution. So seamless access right now is in what we are referring to as a beta phase. Uh, that beta phase is being fully supported by um, SUNET, which is the Swedish uh, Academic Identity Federation. Um, it is a, in, even though it is referred to as a beta phase, it is a full, they're operating it as a full production service. Um, but we do anticipate that after the end of this year, going into next year, probably Internet2 and Jayant will pick this up and run it um, in their context more as a global service. We have a number of integrations um, already underway. Um, Seamless Access is working on the ACS site as well as Springer Nature, which Springer was the, the first site, the first publisher site to make Seamless Access go live. Um, and then a few of the identity federations already ha have Seamless Access working too. I do wanna call, call out that um, the Adapon platform itself now has native support for seamless access. So that means other publishers, like ACS is hosted on the Adapon platform. That means other publishers that also are hosted on Adapon now have a pretty um, uh, smooth pathway in order to enable seamless access on their site. So I think we'll see more and more publishers um, start to go that path now. Um, so similarly, Silverchair is also in the process of making seamless access an option for the publishers that are hosted there as well. So seamless access, as I mentioned, is in use today, both on the ACS site and on nature.com. And I will attempt here to do a quick live demo to show you that it really is. Um, let me see. Are, are you? Can somebody confirm? Can you see my my web browser or not? Yep, yeah. we can see the ACS publications page. Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure. Okay, so here you'll see I'm on an article on the ACS site, and I am not. I'm on my home computer, so I am not on a recognized IP address. And so if I click on this access through your institution. I have to do a one-time search for my institution. I'm going to use an I'm going to use an open access, open Athens account that I that I have access to in order to uh, simulate this. So let me log in. This imagine this is my university login page right now. So this is you know Harvard or Oxford or something like that that I'm logging into. Um, and you'll see that I instantly get access then to the article based upon that login. But now if I go over to nature, 
um, and scroll down to their research section here and pull up a nature article, you'll see that it also says access this article via this seamless access um, institution that I have. So here I simply click on that button and I'm already logged in at Open Athens, so I now have access to this article. Um, that is, you know, so much easier than wading through those uh, search screens that Karen, you know, uh, mentioned in his presentation. And that is exactly the user experience that we are shooting for here with Seamless Access and encouraging other publishers to adopt as well. So I'll talk a bit about the ACS experience here um, in, in this COVID-19 period. Uh, back in February, we received an uh, email from the uh, CARSI, which is the Chinese Federation, that I have a small ex excerpt from that email here. And they were asking us um, to join their federation and to enable federated authentication for about 300 or so of the Chinese institutions that are a member of their federation. And the reason is because as more and more of their patrons were working remotely, um, they started to have bandwidth problems on their campus. And that is because um, when you use proxy solutions or VPN solutions, all of those document downloads actually flow through the campus bandwidth on the way to the remote end user. And that's not the case with federated authentication. You really only access the campus infrastructure for a, during the login page. Um, and then after that, it's totally outside of the campus bandwidth. So um, in March of 2020, as, as we all know, um, US institutions and really institutions across the globe started uh, to go remote and some similar um, bandwidth constraints were realized there as well. So ACS did support the, the CARSI Federation as well as started to enable many other institutions across the globe for federated authentication. And at the same time, it just happened that we were in the process of implementing our seamless access user experience, which went live on, on March 1st. And as a result of all that, we saw a very, very dramatic uptake uh, in federated authentications. Um, ACS has supported Shibboleth and Open Athens and you know, SAML-based authentication for probably about a decade. Uh, and the usage has always been quite consistent, but, but very moderate. Um, in the month of March, we saw a 27-fold increase um, in federated authentications. In the month of April, that turned into more like a 50-fold increase um, in the number of authentications. So it's very clear that um, users were finding this as a very valuable uh, pathway. One of the things that we learned, we actually had a bug on our site um, when we first deployed it. Um, and this, this relates back to the attributes that Todd talked a lot about. Uh, we do not require personally identifiable attributes for anyone to use our, our site, but we found that many campuses were providing them to us. Uh, and we had intended to throw them away, to throw away any personally identifiable attributes, but we had a bug on our site that actually we were reflecting the user's name back in the, uh, in the banner on our site. So we have since fixed that because we believe that um, users should take a deliberate action to identify themselves on our site and not, uh, not we, we shouldn't get that based upon the federated uh, login that occurs. So Todd mentioned that Seamless Access is working on these entity categories and attribute bundles that will really help uh, campuses to understand better how to define the right class of attributes for the type of service that uh, their patrons are logging into. For publishers, I think you will find that we will be requesting pseudonymous identifiers because as I think Todd mentioned, they are really helpful in the case where we detect compromised credentials. And an, another unfortunate consequence of COVID-19 is that we're seeing a significant increase in traffic to Sci-Hub. 
And I have to believe this is a result of, you know, people working remotely and those pathways on publisher sites to content that are so confusing right now. Um, users just abandon uh, trying to figure out how to log in through the publisher site to get access and they're going to Sci-Hub because it's so much easier to do so. So these pseudonymous identifiers are really important um, for us to try to convey back to the campus. When we publishers detect anomalous usage, we often have information that we can convey back to a campus so the campus can figure out whose uh, credentials might be compromised. But many times we don't have enough detail to provide the campus with a, a good clue on which one of their thousands of users that, that might be. Uh, I was on personally on a call not that long ago with both a campus librarian, campus IT, security folks, and we were all frustrated because we clearly knew that they had a compromised account on campus, but we could not, I couldn't provide them with sufficient detail to help them. So these pseudonymous identifiers, you know, we have this, the planning is underway. Um, in the federated authentication space, you know, to have those conveyed through the authentication exchange. We've also started conversations more recently with OCLC as well around uh, the proxy uh, authentications that publishers see to pass a similar pseudonymous identifier to publishers through the OCLC proxy as well. So I'll, I'll close here just quickly that, um, you know, I think our experience has shown uh, that users will follow the, the pathway of least resistance um, to, to the content that they are seeking. And through services like Seamless Access and GetFTR, we believe that we're creating pathways that are easier and to use, frankly, than copying a DOI and running off to Sci-Hub and, and trying to, to find the content through there. Um, but it really does take collaboration between the, the publishing community, the, the library community, and the campus IT you know, groups as well in order to make that all work. So I will stop there, um, see if we have any questions. Great, thanks Ralph. Um, that was really comprehensive. We did get a few questions specifically about GetFTR, so I'd like to focus on that for um, the first few if that's possible. So uh, the first question we got is, how does get FTR differ from a library managed link resolver? Um, and secondary to that, um, we also have a question about the user experience when using get FTR and whether it will impact any other federated logins the library is using later on, um, if it will be seamless alongside other federated access the library is using and so on. Yeah. So first question on the library link resolver. We really view GetFTR as an adjunct to what you already might have in place uh, in terms of library service. You know, GetFTR is, is querying the publisher site directly for the entitlements information. So, you know, we like to say that it's the source of truth about whether or not a, a user is entitled to an article based upon their institutional holdings, where we believe many of the library systems, those entitlements have to be manually entered into, into those systems. And so we're hoping that um, someday GetFTR could lessen the burden on the library community in trying to maintain those in, that entitlement information in a manual way. Um, and in terms of like, in terms of the, whether the library um, system wants to present, you know, a GetFTR link uh, or, you know, their, their own uh, pathways, you know, to content, that's something that we, we leave flexibility to the software provider of the tools um, to the library community to figure out. We're, we're making the service available as an option, basically, to, to help with that. Um, and then the other question I think was on uh, whether it has any bearing on other federated authentication services that a campus might um, might support. No, it, ha it really has no bearing. Um, you know, as, as you saw me log in through my Open Athens account um, and go, you know, from ACS to Nature, um, if I had followed a GetFTR link, you know, to either of those, um, those publisher sites, 
I, it would have been exactly, it would have behaved exactly the same way. I would, would have just been naturally logged in. And so it really has no bearing if you're using Moodle or LinkedIn Learning or, or whatever, it, it really has no bearing on that. Thank you so much. Um, we did receive a number of questions ahead of the webinar as well. Um, and judging by the type of discussion that we've gotten through our Q&A so far, I'd like to call out just a few of them as I think being pretty central to the themes that we've been talking through today. Um, and so the first one is, you know, uh, we've been taken through the different types of data attributes that could be passed during the authentication handshake from completely anonymous to pseudonymous to identifiable and personal. Um, but I want to just, you know, call it out and emphasize this for any libraries who are considering uh, what data might need to be shared. And the question really at its foundational level is what data attributes are required to be shared for federated access, if any. And I think that probably any of the folks here could answer that, but Ralph, since you were just speaking, I might direct it to you. If yeah, yeah, sure. And, and I think that, yeah, the really important thing here to note is that it totally depends on the service that, that your patrons are trying to access. And today, um, unfortunately, we, we have kind of a one size fits all solution that is largely implemented across campuses. And that, and unfortunately that, that one size fits all is, is pretty much just give out everything, give out the user's name and their email address and, you know, everything. Um, and many services, like I said, at ACS, we, we don't, we don't want that. We don't need that. And there are other services that, um, that that would you know that do if you're going to be interacting um, with colleagues on a research collaboration network well you know those you probably want to identify yourself personally um, who that is so so these these attribute bundles that we are working on will provide a lot of clarity um, on on which attributes are appropriate for which kinds of services and will also create a pathway for the software providers to make it much easier to configure those attributes on a service provider by service provider basis. Todd, did you want to say anything else to reinforce? No, that's a great explanation because you can use these systems for any number of services, right? So the library community has an interest in patron privacy, has an interest in anonymous usage. Um, and as Ralph mentioned, we we're working to develop some uh, attribute profiles that allow for the technology, the IT systems to simply choose, okay, this is a library service, we're gonna choose this attribute bundle, which is either anonymous or pseudonymous. Um, if it's, this is a much more robust scholarly uh, research service that needs that information, you can use this one. Um, so we're in the process of, of developing these bundles that the IT staff will be able to implement easily. Uh, and, you know, again, when, if you're at a library and you're talking about implementing seamless access or, or uh, federated identity for your library services, you can say uh, that the refeds community, which is the uh, uh, federation community, has this profile, which is anonymous or pseudonymous, and use that. Uh, we're trying to make this easy to implement both on the library side, but also the IT side as well. Perfect, thank you both. And so sort of a follow on to that theme, um, I, we know from experience in our conversations that many, many libraries do choose at this point to power their single sign on using a pseudonymous identifier because it's not at face value uh, personal information, but it does support a more robust user experience like a personalized user experience. However, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of the time when using a pseudonymous identifier, a library may come back to a question of, well, what kind of usage reports might be supported? Um, and so Kieran, I wanna direct this one to you. Um, if a library chooses to use a pseudonymous identifier uh, and keep things completely without personal data for their authentication system, uh, could they still in some ways achieve a more robust usage reporting? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, there's the good thing about attributes in, in general is they're, you know, they're very flexible. So you can create an attribute for anything, really. If you want to do hair color, you, you can absolutely do, absolutely do that. So yeah, you, you're not uh, foregoing any uh, granularity with statistics by, by using that pseudonymous identifier. I think one thing I will say about attributes in, in general is, I think Seamless Access and R21, they got a lot of criticism when they came to be because, you know, it's a publisher initiative and, you know, lots of librarians are scared that publishers want their data, but the you know, publishers aren't interested in customers' data at all. You know, we can genu genuinely say that about publishers. They, they do care about their users. They're very reactive to their, their customers. Um, so, yeah, they want to consume generally as few attributes as they can. Um, and that is generally across the board. Great, thank you. And Jennifer, I'd love to bring this back full circle to the library perspective. And um, if you can share with us, do you leverage usage reports from your Open Athens or are you planning to um, build into your use re usage reporting right now? Um, so this is our, our second year in Open Athens. And um, so we haven't done that much with them, but we hope to in the future. Um, like I was saying before, it sure was helpful this spring when we needed to show our usage when we were working from home and we wanted to demonstrate, yes, our usage patterns are remaining the same now that our students have moved, um, all of them are off campus. It was a huge help, um, those usage statistics were amazing um, to be able to dig into those. You know, I knew that they were there, um, but it was so easy to be able, you know, I was at my home too, obviously, um, but it was pretty amazing to be able to see those. And, you know, down to people's service providers all over the country to be able to see that, you know, our usage last spring was reflecting this spring. Um, but, you know, we've been thinking about, you know, what we will be doing in the future. Um, and it is pretty interesting, the granularity of what you can get. Great, thank you. So one final question before we close things out. Um, this is for any libraries or attendees who currently use federated access or are considering a migration to a federated access service and want to know how they can leverage the seamless access access point when it's um, being used on their subscribe publishers website. So very simple question um, for libraries who are interested in leveraging seamless access is any action needed to get their organization listed in that search. Generally, the answer there is no. Uh, no action is needed on the library's part. Uh, this is uh, what ha needs to happen is the publisher needs to enable the seamless access user experience. Um, and I guess I, I will say, as long as the library is affiliated with an institution that is either a member of one of these national federations like In Common or the UK Federation or a member of Open Athens, um, that's really the action that you need to take. We, for Seamless Access, we pick up um, all of the institutions that are members of these academic federations as well as Open Athens, and we make them discoverable through Seamless Access. Thank you, Ralph. All right, well, I want to thank all of our attendees today who sat through a full 90 minutes of authentication talk. We appreciate your time and your questions. Um, and I would like to thank all of our panelists, too, for bringing your insight and experience to this conversation. It's so helpful to have every type of stakeholder represented, libraries, publishers, vendors, to see how we're sort of collaborating to try to move this forward. And so with that, I will hand it back over to Kim for any final housekeeping. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was really it. I just wanted to thank everybody. And I did, I put all the links um, from everybody's presentations and a link to um, a page with more resources. Um, and, and that's it. We'll, we'll try to get all those links over to you in the email with the replay as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.